<laughs> and captions, more captions. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Hey, Michelle. Hey, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, we wanted to talk about simple and fine changes. New topic this week. Mm -hmm. hey, Let's see. Let everyone arrive and show. So we're streaming. Let me just pop this in here. We have a challenge mm -hmm. starting next week. Why? Oh, panelists, hold on. Oh. You just, we'll yeah, be on. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, try okay. It. So it's a totally free five day challenge where we'll be doing five uh, whole days. Five whole days. And you'll be there. <laughs> okay. Letting you know now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. Now we're talking about the path to simple and flying changes using our method. And so that starts on Monday of next week. Really easy. Just click the link and get signed up. I'm going to um, go grab it, this link and post it on Facebook and YouTube and all of these places while you get started here. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah. How did you want to start this? Well, a question. So <clears throat> one of our assistants is from South Africa, and she says there are people in her circle of friends and acquaintances. Or she sees online. Or she sees online. Yeah. Who say that, um, you know, show fees are so expensive that they don't want to show at the lower levels. They want to go to the upper level. So they start at medium. And uh, so they basically skip the simple changes because... Mm -hmm. Well, just also, the flying changes. this was kind of a combination, Sally, another one of our team members, she was saying that people are doing this, that it used to be that you had to, um, it was recommended, it wasn't required, but it was recommended that you get a certain number of scores over a certain percentage before you move mm -hmm. up to the next level, but people are finding this too expensive, so they're just skipping things, they're skipping the things they find hard, mm -hmm. and they're skipping the consensus among our this little chat we had was that some people skip mm -hmm. the simple changes because they have difficulty with them. They just want to skip ahead and go to fine changes. Go to the fun stuff. Go to the fun stuff. Yeah, is that something you're familiar with? Has anybody heard? Have you something have like you that? done this? Have you, <laughs> is this a good idea? Do you think? Yeah, because I've never met anybody who did that. And in in Germany, there there is a system where you can't just start your show career at the FEI levels or whatever you have to kind of earn points you know in the lower levels you have to really earn you know the right to show in the upper like levels in the US you can make your debut at Grand Prix if you want exactly so, yeah. you know some people do that they go buy a Grand Prix horse and take some lessons and mm -hmm. you know get to where they can steer the horse through a yeah. test and then they go and show at Grand Prix and it they shows have, we've it seen shows. people like that <laughs> it's obvious not pretty unfortunately but yeah there's so much you learn by going through the levels going through, <laughs> through the ranks essentially but yeah so i'd be actually curious if anybody knows anybody who's done that or who thinks uh, who needs flying who needs simple changes will just go to the flying changes uh -huh. have you done it do you know somebody that's done it maybe some people don't want to admit it <laughs> no um now sandra says i've skipped levels at competition but the training at home goes through every level yeah, so i trade simple good. changes before trying training flying changes. that makes sense yeah exactly you're a smart I mean, woman. It's, yeah it's okay to skip levels at the shows but as long as you do all the you know building blocks in training and teach the horse right. everything let's <laughs> so. talk then a little bit about why this might be a good idea or a bad idea mm -hmm. <laughs> and um why you might want to really make sure your simple changes are confirmed first mm -hmm. <laughs> i gave it away there <laughs> didn't i carolyn dar says only simple changes meaning what you do only simple changes she's probably or you've done. skipped only the simple changes <laughs> no i assume she has, she hasn't done fine changes I only, yet. Yeah, that's I, what i, I assume skipped. i just want to make sure so me, i understand that correctly I need to get this link posted where yeah also next question is any one of you working Sorry. on flying changes about to start have you trained flying changes in the past do you have trouble with flying changes or your horse uh, karen dar says no flying changes ever oh good don't know how we can fix that we can help you <laughs> there's an app for that <laughs> <laughs> flying changes app <laughs> The app is almost. <laughs> yeah. 
we can show you how it's a it's a logical process actually that if the horse has a decent basic canter natural canter they can do it and where can i get it the app <laughs> where can i get the app? <laughs> i'll tell you next week <laughs> you know? no um sign up for the flying changes challenge mm -hmm. exactly. Michelle says, Archie, not ready to do either yet, but would love to do both one day. Yep. Yeah, the building blocks actually start <clears throat> exactly. at the very beginning. Yeah, you can start teaching the horse the skills that go into flying changes at a very early stage, you know, because I think of flying changes as a complex movement that consists of several basic, simple movements. And you can teach the horse these simple, basic skills and basic movements separately and then you put them together into a flying change when they're ready you know yep. so on some level you can say you know you can start preparing flying changes like three years before the horse's canter is at a stage where it makes sense to ask for a flying change but you're, it's a long-term process is like you know put a little seed of a tree in the ground and water it and then eventually there'll be a tree there um won't happen overnight right it takes some time and it's the same with the flying changes you have to plant the seeds or you can plant the seeds early and they improve balance and straightness and suppleness and body awareness and coordination of the horse and so on and the the early stages of the preparation don't look like they have anything to do with flying changes if you practice them nobody will know what you're doing but long-term thinking long-term strategy Oh, Sandra says, just starting them, I've tried the things that have worked with other horses, but it isn't working with this one, so I need some new ideas here. Catherine Turalian says, we're not ready for flying changes yet, but our canter has improved a lot recently, so mm -hmm. I'm keen to learn the prerequisites. Absolutely. Yeah. And <clears throat> you should always, like your theoretical understanding should always be a couple of levels ahead of what you're actually practicing. That So that when the time comes, your horse is ready you're ready too and you know you know what it's all about and sort and of like works. um driving a car you kind of need to know where you're heading so that you actually end up on the right roads to get there if you're just driving around going i don't know i'm trying to get to a birthday party but i'm i, I don't know who's <laughs> you know <laughs> then you're just going to drive around aimlessly you kind of need to know where you're going to be going later even if you're not going there yet yeah. Um, Maggie says, I love doing flying changes, but I know they can be better. We can do threes now, but miss the odd one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's normal. That's yep. normal when you go to tempo changes. Um, it's always, it takes a while before they're really clean and confirmed. And there's always the odd one where the horse changes one stride later or changes late behind or something goes wrong. It's 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 a polishing thing, improving balance, straightness, suppleness, and so on. Um, it, it's just a matter of time. And always going back to the basics, like when I work on flying changes, I always feel like there's a phase where once the horse has the basic idea of the flying changes, I need to go back and improve the quality of the basic canter and the transition. Walk, canter, trot, canter, canter, trot, canter, walk. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, there's a phase after the horse is basically no flying changes, there's a phase where I don't do any flying changes, but I work on improving the basic canter, like on a quarter line, canter, canter, straight, uphill, round, soft, <clears throat> through, relaxed, but bouncy at the same time, energetic, but relaxed, mentally calm, physically relaxed. It's not so easy, actually, right? Because once the horses understand flying changes, they often get excited. And they anticipate and then every time you you move a muscle they think can i do a flying change now do you want it now do you want it now do you mm -hmm. want it now and then they get a little ahead of themselves and they get a little excited and then they start changing all over the place and then you have to go calm down relax mm -hmm. yeah not everything i do is a flying change I, you know you know so so sometimes you almost have to make them forget the flying changes so a yeah. little bit go back to canter 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 <laughs> you know things like that so it's always a time to revisit basics, make things really simple, straight camp, straight line canter, like pearls on a string, every canter stride, exactly like the one before and the one after. On the seat, on the aids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, fun, it's fun, but um, mm -hmm. 
can be a little disconcerting when your horse already did nice flying changes and suddenly he acts like he's never heard of them. He has no idea what they are and everything falls apart. It's a normal phase yeah. in the training. Yeah. Don't panic. Mm -hmm. Just back to basics. Mm -hmm. Back to simple canter straight, you know, walk canter, trot canter and so on. Yeah. And Christina, Bola says I've tr uh, tried them once in a clinic, but I'm still working on the preparation on my own. Carolyn Dar says I need more straightness training. I think she doesn't do a clean flying change, but on her own, yeah. Straightness always plays a role. If there's any issue with the flying changes, it's there's usually a straightness issue involved, usually balance, sometimes suppleness, you know. Mm -hmm. and so you go back, polish those, and then your flying changes get better. And oh, Carolyn says we can't do a canter walk transition. It will be too abrupt. She will halt. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something to work on. Um, so, but to sign up for our challenge to go get back to the original question about skipping simple changes. Yep. Um, <clears throat> simple changes are a prerequisite for the flying changes in the sense that um, in terms of the aids, there are lots of similarities between simple changes and flying changes. And in terms of the, the horse's movement patterns, there are lots of similarities. I mean, you can think of the flying change as a transition into the canter from the canter you know so if you think look at it from that perspective then you you see new um opportunities maybe or new you know ways in which you can approach the flying change um and i remember when i was young i i read that somewhere in a book that the flying change is just like a transition into the canter from the canter. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it made no sense to me whatsoever. I thought, that's stupid. And <laughs> I can't do anything with that information. But now, 40 years later, I get it. <laughs> Only took 40 <laughs> years, but I get it. <laughs> it really works. <laughs> you can really you approach it. Like, you, yeah, you I'm, just, I'm slow sometimes. I know. Uh, yeah, sometimes. Sorry. <laughs> sometimes. Uh, yeah, but yeah, so, so, but if you practice the, aids of canter walk walk canter you're on some level practicing already aids for the flying change and mm -hmm. the, the horse practices the mechanics mm -hmm. of the flying change um like for the anyone really to get canter walk transition with no trot strides because you need a good connection from your weight through the inside hind to the ground for the canter walk transition if you get trot strides then that weight doesn't go all the way through the horse blocks it somewhere and then you get canter canter trot trot walk <laughs> you know so there's always this resistance of the inside hind against the weight or it can be it can show up as this canter and in order to be able to get it down to what would be a walk you end up getting too much you get this abrupt halt mm -hmm. and the horse kind of slams on the front legs yeah that can also be mm. a tactic of, on the horse's part to avoid um, flexing the inside hind and, and taking the weight into the inside mm -hmm. hind. And an up transition always comes from the outside hind. The outside hind has to flex under the weight, support the weight, and lift it up. And uh, in the flying change, the old inside hind becomes the new outside hind, and the old inside hind has to flex under the weight and lift the horse up into the flying change. It's like a spring that compresses and extends again. Um, so if you can't do a clean canter walk transition, you may have trouble with a flying change because that in old inside hind isn't letting the weight connect to the ground enough. And uh, so the, up the next up transition will be not so great if you do a simple change and the flying change won't be so great if the inside if you can't connect to the inside hind leg and it could be that you know when you can't connect to the inside hind and you try a flying change it could happen that uh, the horse doesn't change or the horse changes in front but not behind or he's late behind or he changes one stride after the aid which is not a big deal if you just do one flying change but if you try a series of fours or threes or twos and the horse changes one stride after you give the aid well then it's not going to be threes it's going to be a four in there right 
so and then messes up your whole line of tempo changes and in the competition that's expensive right then you get a four mm -hmm. as a score even if all the changes are perfect but one has the wrong number attached to it then four too bad you know costly mistake <clears throat> so um yeah so the, these connections to the old inside hind the new outside hind they're super important for the quality of the down transition the quality of the up transition and, and the flying change that can make the difference between flying change and no flying change you know um also in um when when you're practicing flying changes the horses usually go through a phase where they get excited they build up tension and sometimes they build tension against your inside leg and rein and then they trigger the change themselves mm -hmm. it's almost like they make it happen you know it's like the self-fulfilling prophecy they manifest it yeah exactly <laughs> and uh in in situations like that where the horse gets excited or nervous or so um i do a transition to the walk and then either walk long rein or walk mm -hmm. relax a little at the walk prepare canter again so i use the simple change to bring mm -hmm. the horse back to me get him to relax yes. get him to focus on me things like that right um so that happens you know, with a lot of horses that, that, you know, once they understand the basic idea of the flying change, they get excited. They they think we're going to do a change any any time now, any stride is going to be the change. It's going to happen. I know it. It's going to be the next one. It's going to be the next one, right? And then they spin their wheels a little bit and they get a little frantic. And then you have to say, come down, relax, wait, wait. Stay you know, with, stay with me. me, you know. Um, um, there are certain... Sometimes, if you, the thing is too, when, when you train flying changes, a little bit of anticipation is good. So it's good to use a certain pattern, a certain line, so the horse has a little bit of an idea of what's coming up, right? But it can then take on a life of its own, and then all of a sudden the horse goes on autopilot and it just changes, you know. And then you have to change things. Then you can um, ride the same pattern, but do a down transition to the walk before you get to the spot where you normally do the flying change or keep cantering past that spot and do a down transition later or maybe do a down walk transition and walk on a long lane or walk transition walk for a minute and canter same lead or other lead yeah so just you, you disrupt that pattern you tell you show the horse that just because we're riding this line doesn't mean we will always do a flying change and this particular letter or whatever but you know sometimes we stay in the canter and then we do a counter canter or if it's a, a line where you change direction sometimes we walk and we take a break sometimes we walk and then we pick up the the canter again and it could be the same lead or could be the other lead so it's, you know and it's not always the transition is not always in the same place it's sometimes it's earlier before the letter sometimes it's after the letter and so on um <clears throat> another Oh, yeah, in the German group, yeah, we just did this this whole thing in German. There was one horse that likes to <clears throat> change leads when she's counter cantering because the counter canter gets tiring for the inside hind, and so the horse just flips the lead, you know, and just switches, swaps, Swap. swaps exactly. And uh, so, what do you do, right? So then, in that in that situation, you when they they don't like the counter canter so much, you can ride a very slight renvers position so you let the haunches yield a little to the outside you step into the inside stirrup rear front rear and drive a little with the outside leg and you have to be very careful with the inside lower leg because the horse will take that as an excuse or will understand this as an aid for the flying change mm -hmm. so no inside lower leg in those cases only inside thigh outside lower leg and with the stirrup stepping and the little haunches out position you stabilize the counter canter whereas if you move the shoulders out so it becomes more like a, a counter shoulder in position that makes the flying change look awfully attractive and inviting right and then any touch of the inside lower leg makes the horse switch leads you know so um yeah so you have to, to then think of, of strategies and because the on the one hand, you have to be happy that the horse offers a flying change because you want them at some point, right? You, so you don't want to give the horse the idea that 
flying changes are bad or you don't want them but at the same time you don't want this to get out of control either right so and often then also canter to walk relax is a good strategy you know even in the counter canter you could go walk long rain relax or you could do a counter canter on the middle circle and then on the center line ride a half vaulted to the outside and then you're back in true lead canter on the other on the other rain uh, like yeah. Joyce Kerrig says we've been working on changes for a long time. Mm -hmm. My mare is very capable of doing them, but she has all kinds of evasions. She gets she anticipates and gets too stuck in an overcollected canter, mm -hmm. or she does the change and then takes off bucking afterwards. They might be related, actually. It uh -huh. could be that she sucks back a little bit yeah. and then she does this sort of rocking horse canter on the spot behind the aids and then yeah. the flying change can kind of release all that pent-up energy into into bucking spree so there you may have to actually lengthen the stride mm -hmm. these two things seem like they're mm -hmm. polar opposites but they're actually both from the same cause two sides of the same yeah. coin yeah yeah, yeah sucking it's back and explode <laughs> and ex exploding can be it's the same thing basically the horse's look gets behind the aids so there you could even practice, you know, in competition tests, there's this diagonal medium canter change at the end. So you could you could try something like that. Go on the diagonal, lengthen the stride. It doesn't have to be medium canter, just nice longer strides, one stride a little longer than the previous one, and then prepare and change at the end, or briefly half hold and change. You have to see, you know. Or just practice for a bit the transitions between mm -hmm. regular normal collected canter mm -hmm. and not necessarily a medium canter although you could go that far but just a bit of a lengthening so you bring the horse out and in out and hit in so you make the horse like an accordion and make sure you test mm -hmm. are you really in front of my leg are you really on the seat yeah um yeah so the lengthening and and bringing back is important too, just like the, the transitions in and out of the candor. And that just actually, what Shanna was saying, reminded me that I there was a video of Carl Hester and Charlotte Dujon Darren's, I don't know, quite a few years old by now, mm -hmm. where they did a demonstration of flying changes and can't remember. That was like the Vallegro era, but I don't know if, if she wrote Vallegro or somebody else. Um, they showed flying changes and she would canter, lengthen the stride, collect and change. Like on the on the long side, even you know, just a little bit forward, and then just for one or two strides, bring the horse mm -hmm. back a little, and so you still have that power from the lengthening, the pushing of the hind legs, and you just collect enough so they don't fall apart and do the change. And that that worked beautifully. So that, that's a a thing that might work for your horse too. You know, first the lengthening, collecting, and then lengthen. And just a tiny bit back and change. It's a good preparation for working on tempo changes too, mm -hmm. actually, because one of the big mistakes in the tempo changes is that the horse gets shorter and tighter and shorter <laughs> and tighter, and you end up with this uh, yeah, thing exactly. going on. Mm -hmm. And you want to keep the purity of the canter between each of the changes. And this can actually be a difficulty. Mm -hmm. So, really practicing these sorts of transitions like that can be super, super helpful. So you develop a habit of forwardness in the canter, in, in the flying changes so that the horse is always mm -hmm. staying in front of your leg and is thinking forward, even in the changes. Yeah. Mm. yeah, for me, flying changes are all about the quality of the basic canter and polishing the basics. If basics are good, the quality of the canter is good. Flying changes are the easiest movement of all, almost. Mm -hmm. If you have trouble with the flying changes, then either the basic natural canter is not good enough, not straight enough, not round enough, not bouncy, not, not round, not through enough, mm -hmm. um, and or the transitions are you know into the canter, out of the canter, and lengthening, collecting, are not good enough. So if you if you go back to these basics, you really polish them, and then when you feel like okay, we made progress, this feels better now. Then try a flying change; it'll probably be a lot smoother and better mm -hmm. than before. And sometimes that means no flying changes mm -hmm. for several weeks, yeah. polishing the basics, mm 
I mean, what would be the point, you know, just to confirm that you're having trouble with Mm. the flying change, just trying it over and over and over again doesn't necessarily usually make it better. What actually makes it better Mm. is going back and looking at all of the components Mm -hmm. of the change, whether it's a simple change or flying change, Mm -hmm. actually going back and looking at all of these components and polishing those, polishing the rock. Mm -hmm. So I always Mm -hmm. called it, Mm -hmm. polish them and then when it, that's feeling good again, when you have this figured out and mm. polished, then come back and use the fine change uh, or simple change as a test. Yeah, exactly. I, I often use flying changes as a test of how straight my horse is, how balanced, how round, how bouncy, yeah. how smooth the canter is. Um, it's a quality test, mm-hmm. really, in a, in a way. Um, yeah, because the flying change can be a bit of a magnifying glass. It can show mm-hmm. up things that were kind of lurking in the shadows. Mm-hmm. They'll come out in the flying change because mm-hmm. it's a dramatic transition in a way from one canter lead to the other canter lead. Mm-hmm. And it shows up, you know, stiffness issues, lack of suppleness, balance issues mm-hmm. when the horse is behind the, the leg mm-hmm. or or just completely not on the seat. Mm-hmm. It um, shows up. Uh, especially straightness issues. Did yeah. I say straightness? But that really shows up quite a bit. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I mean, you, at the lower levels, you can often okay, yeah. at the lower levels you can often get by with being a little sloppy with certain things, mm-hmm. and the horse can still do it or fake it at least. But the the higher you climb up the levels, the smaller the margin mm-hmm. for error become. And then, yeah, you may top out at a certain stage. And, and you you can't move on. You can't do the next movements because there are holes in the basics. Yeah. And you may be able to get a single flying change, but no tempo changes because maybe in the flying change the horse rotates and, get, and lands crooked, and then you're not ready for the next change, or the horse falls on the forehand a little bit and then starts running away a little bit. And then, of course, he's not ready to do another flying change right again, uh, right afterwards. So, right? so then, the, the, you know, it it really brings you back or fo- forces you to focus on on the basics. You know, this dead straight, uphill, round, smooth, connected. You know, connected from back to front, yeah, and front connected to, back, to the ground. To the ground, you know, that the aids will connect into the ground. Yeah, it's it's humbling in 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 a way, but <laughs> all your flying changes problems usually go away if you just go back to basics and polish those, and then <clears throat> try a flying change to to test. If you feel like okay, now this feels a lot better, <clears throat> feel like my horse is rounder, smoother, more connected, and so on, then try another flying change and see if it's better. And usually it is. And that can become a mindset issue for the rider mm-hmm. too, because. As humans, we tend to get fixated on what it is we're trying to accomplish. And you, at that point, when you're encountering these problems in the simple changes or flying changes, the answer is not to just get, to push through. Pushing through is not going to help. Right. With that, it's actually a sign you need to take a step back yeah. and look at these components and work on them. Yeah. But you know, then we have to get our heads into gear too. Yeah. You know, I speak from personal experience. I've been through things. <laughs> we all have. Yeah. Michelle says, do you get counter canter established before the changes? A little bit, but not too much. I don't want the horse to be too comfortable in the in the counter canter. But, you know, mm-hmm. people sometimes practice counter canter to the point where the horses can do a six meter volt in the counter canter and they're perfectly happy. And then they're so comfortable with the counter canter that they see no need to change leads. And maybe by that time they have formed the opinion or the impression that <clears throat> flying changes are not wanted mm-hmm. or not, you know, they're not, not a thing. They're not a thing. Like we don't do flying changes. Yeah, they're not mm-hmm. allowed, they're not mm-hmm. wanted. And then if they get that idea that they're not allowed or not wanted, then you may never get them. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. And uh in the past there were People who are very ambitious about showing at the lo- lower levels and, and getting the counter canter right. And then if the horse accidentally changed leads, they would punish the horse because they were frustrated and mad and they wanted to get that higher score. Mm-hmm. And then 
the horses thought counter can uh, the flying change is not allowed so they would get scared of flying changes they would get scared of the beating and then that was the end of their career right at this very low level you know where you just do sing, uh, simple changes yeah. they top out and they don't move up to the medium or upper levels fei levels because now they're scared of the flying changes and that can be so traumatic that you will mm -hmm. you will never overcome that that's why yeah. we have a related question susan fisher says my mare has a nice clean natural change mm -hmm. but only when she wants to do them which is whenever she is asked to counter canter mm -hmm. we're working on simple changes and they're going well but are stuck on counter canter mm -hmm. a clinician we worked with recommended skipping the counter canter and training a solid flying change first then going back to counter canter i'm not sure if this is a good idea or not um, you can the, the even I can't remember who was it. There was one Olympic rider or trainer who did the flying changes first and then the counter canter. I mean, this horse already does a counter canter. It does. So I'm not sure what she means by I mean, being stuck said, on yeah. She does a change, but only when she wants to. Mm -hmm. Which is a, so which is whenever she's being asked to counter canter. So when you counter canter, she wants to do a flying change. It sounds like. I'm not sure if the horse can't counter canter or if every time you're counter cantering. So what is the issue that you can only get the flying change from counter canter or that you cannot prevent the horse from changing leads in the counter canter? Or maybe both. So if she changes leads on, on autopilot, then you can try what I had mentioned earlier, counter canter, renvers position a little bit, step inside rear, front rear, and then massage a little with the outside leg, drive the outside hind leg a little bit. And don't stay in the counter canter too long, but um, like think of riding mi middle circle, you know, the, depending on where you, you start, like you could ride a middle circle and at the center line, vault is to the outside. So you could do in the trot or in the walk, okay. middle circle, and then Vault it to the outside, pick up the true lead, back to the 20 meter circle. Now you're on a counter canter, opposite um, center line, turn onto a vault it to the outside. Now you're in true lead, things like that. So short distances in counter canter, and then either change direction so you're back in true lead or down transition. Okay. Walk. So she answered, she will change instead of counter canter, and you can't prevent her from changing. Um. Yeah. You can, you can practice flying changes and counter canter um, at the same time. She needs to learn that there is a counter canter and mm -hmm. there is a flying change. It's not black or white, right? And there, right. you know, and she needs to know the difference that now I want to stay in the, on this lead. I don't want to change. And then now I want to change. Horses go through that sometimes that they, they get the flying changes and then they they just don't know when yeah, they, they think anything you do with flying change. And then you have to tell them, no, 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 there is a counter canter too. Sometimes I don't want to change. Sometimes I want to stay on this lead. And so my, my experience is that if you ride a little bit renvers, step inside rear front, rear, and outside leg, outside leg, um, makes the flying change unattractive to the horse and it makes them more likely to stay in the counter canter. And then also don't, uh, tempt fate by cantering two miles in the counter canter, but do a few strides and walk or change direction again. Sometimes it's good to um, canter, true lead, change maybe out of a circle, counter canter, or down the diagonal, and then you come out in counter canter, ride a short side, cut the corners a little bit, and then go back on the diagonal, sit back on true lead. So you go into the counter canter, out of the counter canter. So, so it's easy, right? In and out, not too long, nothing too dramatic, nothing too, too stressful, too tiring. And uh, yeah, or you bring the horse back to the walk from the counter canter is always an option, right? Or you could go second or third track, whole school, True lead, canter, canter, walk, counter, canter, three, four strides, and walk. That's a really good and exercise. Lead. Yeah, that gets the horse to it, to pay attention. Yeah. And uh, they, 
and the the the, the times the, the time they spend in the counter can is not so long that the hind legs start aching and they feel like oh i've got to get out of this counter care that's killing me you know and then they because if it's if it gets hard they change leads right if you ride a canter half pass and the inside hind leg gets fatigued they change and then suddenly you know you're not half passing but you're doing like a plie of sorts right mm -hmm. or if you do a <clears throat> if you try a pirouette and you make it a little smaller than the horse can handle they change leads in the pirouette you know sometimes just behind sometimes they change mm -hmm. clean it's always a sign that the inside hind leg feels a little bit picked on, you know, and overburdened. Overburdened, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So then, then think about what line could I ride that's a little easier, a little less weight on the inside hind, and think of the transitions. Only a few strides, counter canter, and walk. You could even go counter canter, walk, long rein, little break, pick up the reins. True lead canter, walk, counter canter, walk, long rein, things like that. You know, so always de-escalate, get the horse comfortable again, you know, things, things like that. And then they they will start to learn the difference. And then, you know, when you feel like, okay, now they're understanding that I want to stay in the counter canter sometimes, then you can say, okay, now let's do a flying change on purpose this time. You know, and then you you mix them, you know, sometimes I want to change, sometimes I want a counter canter. Mm -hmm. It's a phase of confusion that the horses often go through, you know, as they're learning flying changes. And then you have to help them sort it out, which is which. Excuse me, so Ariana Aldrin asks, is everything done in the canter or some trot work? I think she means that it's when you go back to polishing the basics and doing all of this. Um, I mean, you can you can improve the basic canter through trot work and walk work, of course. But when you when you're practicing flying changes and you're trying to improve the basic canter, there comes a time where you really have to practice the canter in the canter, mm -hmm. the straightness, the roundness, the uphill, the connectedness to the ground, and so on. There is a time and a place where the horse's basic canter is good enough or should be good enough. The, and they, they should be strong enough then at that point to canter several minutes in a row without needing a break, without needing oxygen, <laughs> you know. So, um, yeah, canter work is hard, right? Upper level mm -hmm. work takes a lot of strength and a lot of stamina. So you need to build that stamina too. The horses have to be athletes. Which means that there is there comes a time when you actually do have to spend a little bit of time in the canter every ride and you canter 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 make the horse really straight connect the inside pair of legs to the ground see if you can change the bend straight uphill round and so you canter quite a bit at that in that phase of the training um in the earlier stages you improve the canter by not by not cantering right by doing <laughs> lots of walk and trot works um transitions lateral movements in the trot and then there comes a point where you need to polish the canter um, by cantering. That's true. Although there are a lot of preparatory exercises that we use to prepare the horse for the flying changes and simple changes. <clears throat> and a lot of it's done initially in the trot. Actually, you can do a, quite a bit of these exercises and work in the trot to build these basics, and then you take it into the canter too. So, yes and no. <laughs> And Laura Dobronsky, good question. She says, do you feel that some breeds are more naturally built to do advanced dressage movements, or is it just a matter of correct training, no matter the breed? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. It's a little bit like anybody can play basketball, right? And it's good for you, and you know, you can get it a certain be skill. It could be fun. But if you're five feet tall, then you probably won't make it to the NBA, right? So then the, the six foot, seven foot people or whatever, you know, they, they have an advantage over the five foot people. Mm -hmm. Or ballet. Ballet is probably to some extent good for everybody. You know, it teaches you certain skill and suppleness and voice grace and voice and everything else. But yeah, if you're a woman who's six feet tall, you're probably not going to make it to be a prima donna at the, the Met or some something, but it's still good for you. Well, I remember many years ago, I remember that uh, some football team, they put all of their football players through ballet yeah, training, no, yeah, yeah, and it improved their NFL, performance yeah. on the field, right? Yeah. But none of them 
they would, would ever be able to be a professional yeah they would be higher than i was <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah but yet it and, uh, helps them so same sort of thing <laughs> and it's the same i mean in, in dressage especially with the upper level movement there are certain confirmation types and breeds that have an advantage mm -hmm. um like upper level dressage uh, most of the movements are canter movements right so if you have a horse that has a really good natural canter you have an advantage mm -hmm. if you have a horse that has a really bad natural canter or a horse that prefers never, never to canter like if they're in the pasture and they always walk and trot yep they never canter unless they're really in a hurry and they go flat out galloping <clears throat> then it's going to be difficult then you have the work your work cut out for yeah. you really <laughs> um the gated horses usually don't have an especially good canter so right for with them you have to build a good canter first they tend to be flat and fast and downhill and that makes it very difficult and for the upper level dressage work you need a horse that has a round and bouncy canter so the baroque horses will have an advantage the warm bloods will have an advantage thoroughbreds usually have a good canter right um, usually not always not all, but usually they don't, but yeah. often they do yeah mm -hmm. um the horses with the short stubby legs and big bodies they often are at a disadvantage mm -hmm. you know they just don't have the same yeah. suppleness and bounciness and or elasticity in the gates they don't have the same suspension as the horses with a little bit longer longer legs i mean if you're um, horse shopping and you have a a choice between a horse with a really fancy fancy trot that makes everyone go, ooh, and ah, mm -hmm. or a horse with a really good, an acceptable trot, but mm -hmm. a really good canter. Mm -hmm. I would always recommend you choose the horse with the good canter. You can mm -hmm. improve the trot far more than you can improve the canter. Mm -hmm. You can improve the canter quite a bit, mm -hmm. but it's more work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I've only heard of one Icelandic that learned a flying change. Usually, Icelandics have such a fast, flat canter that they're not not balanced and uphill enough to do flying changes. Hmm. So, with an Icelandic, it's going to be difficult. You know, you, it's not impossible, but difficult. If you buy a Lusitano, it's going to be a lot easier to get to the flying changes. Yeah. And <clears throat> as a, as a general rule of thumb, I mean, we've worked with a very large variety of different breeds and you can always see for what job they were bred mm -hmm. they are always good at whatever job they were historically bred to do anything outside of that not so easy yeah mm -hmm. it's more difficult so if you choose a horse from a breed that's been bred for dressage for the last 400 years or more it's going to be a little easier than if you you know take a horse that was bred for a completely different job mm -hmm. you know so so at some point then you 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 have to wonder whether that makes sense to work kind of against the nature of the horse if you try to do things with a horse that are never in that job description especially if it's horse. making the horse or you or both of you unhappy okay. you know maybe Let's say you have an Icelandic and you're like, we've got to get those flying changes. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe. Because it's of, not what he was bred to do. Yeah. Right? Maybe you should just mm -hmm. say, okay, yeah. we're never going to go to compete in Grand mm -hmm. Prix dressage. So maybe we just mm -hmm. decide we don't need the flying changes. And that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, they're good at other things. Yeah. Right? So that's important to keep in mind and you can still do dressage yeah. work yeah. with this horse to improve their soundness their health their way of moving all of these things it still benefits them without ever doing a flying change and uh yeah i remember in in the us at one point we were told about people trying to do western pleasure with a lipizzan and lipizzans are built kind of with an upright neck and they're bred for upper level dressage now if you try to force them to go with their nose on the ground all the time like these peanut rollers you create a seriously unhappy horse you know mm -hmm. because that's the the opposite of what he was trying to do so yeah. that makes no sense right it's like with dogs right dogs are bred for certain jobs and if you try to use a job dog for a breed uh, for a job that's completely opposite of what he's bred to do <laughs> there's gotta be trouble you know? yeah try to get a border collie to be a, a 
quiet lap dog, <laughs> you know, oh. you know, I, now I'm going to get all the messages from people saying, my border collie is so comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I've known many that are just, they're workaholics, mm. you know, exactly. yeah, yeah it, it's working against their nature that mm. you, you're fighting an uphill battle. Yeah. If you're trying to get the horse to do something yeah. that they're really not. Yeah. I've tried to well keep a Siberian Husky in a little apartment in the, in the city, right? That's not going to go well. I did that. <laughs> that wasn't that bad. But... She was not happy. She was, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, you can think of a million examples, you know, um, when when you're interested in a certain discipline of dressage, of, of horsemanship, any, anything, yeah, try to find a horse that was sort of bred to do the job that if makes it easier for you on the horse. If for a new horse, right. yeah. Yeah. If you have a horse already, then... Uh, look at what was the breed mm -hmm. meant to do what's the normal so they, job description so you can be realistic with your yeah. expectations and then mm -hmm. do that and then you can use dressage as physiotherapy yes. and improving suppleness balance straightness body awareness but not with a view of high performance that would be the thing right. it's like I'm going to send my daughter to ballet not because she's going to be a prima donna at the Met but because it's good for her to a point, right? And then there comes a point where it's like, don't push her anymore. This is not good for her. She's never going to be able to do it. She's unhappy. She's going to break down. Especially physically. if it's yeah, not yeah. their thing, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, like, let's say with a horse. Let's say you take an Icelandic and you say, I want to do working equitation with my Icelandic. Mm. You can do a lot of the stuff, mm. but you need to be realistic. You're probably never going to be competing at the working equitation championships. championships because that horse is probably not going to do those flying changes you know, and so on. You can probably hold all through it all, you know, you know, mm. all sorts of things. You can do it for great fun and agility. It's great. Mm. There's so much you can do, but you need to be realistic. So we went off on a tangent awesome. as we often do. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I mean, it's a good question though. You know, It is. It is. That's why we, it, we got going and talking. Yeah. So some people will tell you that every horse can do Grand Prix and you just have to train it right and blah, blah, blah. But the reality <laughs> is for some horses, that's a whole lot easier than for others. And some horses will never make it there. And if you think of people and the talents they have and the sports they can do, or dogs, the jobs they were bred to do, and then try to do something different. It's like water dogs, right? They're bred and trained to retrieve fowl and then deliver the fowl unharmed, basically, right? After you shot it. Try to do that with uh, like a side hound. I think it's going to eat the the duck or, you know, sure. if they even, I don't know if they go in the water or not. You know, if you have a have great no hound, idea. I don't know if they, I, but, but they'll, they're, yeah. they'll certainly run after it, but they probably, yeah. and then they'll eat it. Yeah. They, they're not going to bring it to you intact. So, oh, I don't know. I have no idea. Maybe they will. Well, it's just my guess. <laughs> 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 yeah. But, you know, if you look at horses from that point of view, what are they bred to do? What does the conformation look like? What's the temperament like? Are they suitable for the job? You know, and then yeah, you'll you'll see. Well, there are some that are more suitable than others. Like on some level, if you think of dressage as physiotherapy, it's good for all horses, no matter what breed, no matter. But it doesn't mean that every horse out there will go to the Olympic Games. You know. Just like not every little girl that starts taking ballet lessons will be a prima donna at one of the big companies, or not every kid that plays basketball will go to the NBA. It's just some of them have the talent, some of them don't. Some of them, you know, work hard and they get there even if they're not the most talented. And you have that in horses too and in riders. Absolutely. But yeah, there's. It doesn't a... mean it's not worth doing. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> so I have to see what, what's possible, what's not possible, and then be fair, you know, so you're not <laughs> forcing the horse to, to do something that he hates and that he absolutely can't do, you know. So, I'm just <laughs> so Laura Gavros Gavronski says, so I should pass on the Icelandic pony <clears throat> for the Triple Crown. Probably. Probably. <laughs> it's a funny one. Yeah. <laughs> He'll be the slowest Triple Crown participant in history, probably. Because <laughs> the legs are just shorter, <clears throat> you know. Even at the flying turf, they're probably not as fast as a, as oh, yeah. a thoroughbred in a full to, gallop. You'd have to fill it all with just Icelandics. I know. Doesn't that? 
maybe yeah, interesting that's funny that's a, but yeah it's a good one i yeah. mean that that shows you like it's sometimes if you go to extreme, extreme i always like to go to extremes that are completely absurd to to to, to understand the, the basic idea the basic principle mm-hmm. and then it's what well, duh obviously right yeah <laughs> so <clears throat> yeah um carolyn dar says what do you do with a barbie horse well define barbie horse. literally a barbie horse like literally plastic or or you know the the horse that just looks really you pretty. can always and you know i don't know wash their hair and dress them up nicely braid them. And <laughs> braid them. i know pictures of them <laughs> i don't know <laughs> those would be halter halter horses in a way right they're often practically useless except but... i think halter horses are they become such a uh, but they're often not rideable, really. Yeah, they just uh, yeah. And so they're, they're basically an Barbie horses. It's just the looks, breeds, yeah. They end up, you know, just um they lack function. They get so bred for just looks that they lack function. Sure, it's just huffling and nowadays the bred to be pretty. Uh, there's this huge spectrum of hufflingers, isn't there? There's the yeah. old stout work type, you know, yeah, yeah the, the rugged mountain ponies. And then there are the elegant looking ones that are more like sport horses that mm-hmm. have a lot of Arab in them. Mm-hmm. And there are probably some that are, you know, a little bit useless because they got the worst of all worlds, right? So that always happens. You have three swords. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've met some cool halflingers, yeah. but if you have the big body, short legs, mm-hmm. short fat neck, you know, big head, they're a challenge to get through and supple and light not so easy right and then there are some that are a little bit like sport horses they're just right they're nice and then you know maybe if they have a little too much arab they can maybe be a little i don't know flighty flighty mm. dixie we had a, a student in clinics mm. in germany who had a half liner that was really flighty mm. really spooky yeah so i mean half lingers and arabs are very different breeds so if you cross them you get all kinds of funny I mean, kind of mixes halflingers excuse me i'm losing my voice halflingers are essentially little draft horses yeah. and then you breed them with an arab which is a very hot horse hot blood and if, mm. that's people think if you breed hot and cold you get warm <laughs> you know mm. you e- actually end up with often a mix of parts and occasionally you're going to get a really great specimen but many times you're going to get a weird mix yeah. as happens yeah Laura, the one says, yeah. can going over cross rails help with lead changes? Um, what I've found is that the horses, if you put a pole down or a jump or a cross rail, horses may do the flying change over those markers. But then when you take the markers away, it doesn't transfer them. They don't understand that they're supposed to change. So it, it, I find that it doesn't solve the problem really because it doesn't teach them the uh, skills that they need for the flying change. So I usually find that that's kind of a dead end, you know, because yeah, you may be able to do a flying change as you go over the pole or over the cross rail, but yeah, take it away. And then the horse doesn't know what you're talking about suddenly. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, Carolyn says, my halfling was don't have error, but two of them are talented in the dressage. Oh, nice. Good nice yeah i mean there's some there's a big big spectrum of mm. halflingers and some are quite nice they're quite fancy you know so then you know if they're talented you know oh kathy posts a question from ingrid edison mm-hmm. been long lining last three months three times a week and checking in via riding every 14 days huge difference in my horse's strength and balance finally able to work seriously in canter fabulous yeah the long reining can really help yeah. in improving balance and body awareness and that transfers to the riding under saddle so when you get back on the horse i've had that too that i would long rein a horse for a while and getting back on it's like oh my god it's different you know it's much more balanced and more mm-hmm. compact and because at the long rein they can you know they can work on their own balance without the weight of the rider and without you know the you know the disturbances of the weight on their backs and then it, yeah, it can really move the training forward under saddle when you long rein for a while. Hmm, Stephanie <clears throat> says, my fjord is definitely can't a challenge, but he has such a lovely temperament. Yeah, that's common. Mm-hmm. Would love to manage the occasional flying change, but for competition, our goal will be to rest, uh, content exploring the beginnings of second, second level. 
There mm -hmm. are some Grand Prix fjords, mm -hmm. but they don't look like the traditional fjords. They are very, they're much lighter in a in a way. The neck not neck not as thick and short, and the head not as big and a little lighter body, slightly longer legs in comparison. I don't know if they cross them with something to to change Probably that or just selective breeding or selective yeah. breeding. Yeah, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, you have to look at the confirmation of of your fjord. You know, it's. I mean, it's been done, right? It's possible mm -hmm. to teach them to all the way to, to Grand Prix, but not not every fjord has that <clears throat> body type that you need. Yeah. They're not the old type with a sh really short, thick neck and the gigantic body and the short legs. And so they're much more like similar to the to the halflingers. There is a the sport horse type that's a lot sleeker, mm -hmm. slightly smaller body, longer legs, a little longer more curved neck naturally a little bit more arched neck and yeah with them you, you can do you know all kinds of stuff and and the the very old style is more limited right and the fjords traditionally didn't have a very good canter the hufflingers didn't have a good canter because really they're pack animals right traditionally up and down the mountains walk and trot they didn't need to canter pulling logs they, yeah they need to do you know you, you know, carry stuff stuff and, and so on so upper level dressage or canter work wasn't really in their job description so that's why they um the really old style is going to be difficult and then of course then you know fashion changes the, you know people love the fjords and the halflingers for the temperament mm -hmm. but they want to do other things they don't just want to you know go packing up the mountains or hauling logs or so you know um, so then the, the breeding changes and then, then you see, you know, sometimes a little bit weird products, you know, as you're crossing things and, but then you get, you know, horses that can actually do other things as well. So the, the, the breeding direction was adjusted to the market, really, you know, yeah. just like with the Frisians, Frisians were driving horses, they often had no canter or a very bad canter, but they could be out from Passage and they could do extended trial, it was great. And then the customers didn't want to drive them. They wanted to ride them and they wanted to canter. So the breeding of the Frisians changed quite a bit. Now you get Frisians that have quite a good canter mm -hmm. and they are Grand Prix Frisians, right? Mm -hmm. Quite a few. Yeah. So you always have to look very closely. Mm -hmm. If you love those breeds and you have one of those, you have to look really what kind of Frisian fjord halfling mm -hmm. is it, you know? And keep it what all is in it built like? Yeah, exactly. So, so you do the best with what you have, essentially, right? So. <clears throat> Ariana Aldrin here said, uh, thanks to be encouraging for us, not so competitive people who just want to help the horses be better. Yeah. I mean, you can always use dressage to make the horse better at the day job, whether it's a cutting horse, a roping horse, an eventer, you know, a racehorse. I mean, Egon von Eindorf told me that in back in the 20s and 30s, they would ride the, the um, racehorses, the thoroughbred racehorses uh, in dressage, and they would piaf them and everything, or they would do dressage with the carriage horses, the more the fancier carriage horses, and they would teach them piaf and everything, because they would be better carriage horses, better driving horses, if they are trained in dressage, and they can piaf and stuff. Or the the thoroughbreds at the racetrack, if they do dressage work, they probably last longer. They probably stay sounder longer, you know. So it, mm. you could always use it to make the horse healthier, sounder, better <laughs> at whatever your day job is. And that's a little different focus from I'm going to go to the Olympic Games with this horse, right? That's that's a little bit of a different ball game. So. Um, so you have to be be clear on what what's the point of my dressage training? What do I want to achieve? Do I want to go to the Olympic Games with this horse, or do I just want to be him the best horse he can be within breed specifications and job description? And you know, yeah. I mean, even when if you just want to go out hacking, it's an advantage to have a dressage trained horse because they're a lot nicer on trails when they're dressage trained because they're smoother to sit, more comfortable lighter on the aids maneuverable. You know, maneuverable that's not to say every dressage horse makes a good trail horse that's true, true. <laughs> <laughs> some of them hate going out on mm. trails they like 
Mm. They like arena work only. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions. Hazel Jones asks, how would you prepare for a really good canter to walk transition when training this for the first time? Hmm. Well, we do the canter walk transition into the inside hind leg. Okay. I was, if I was going to answer this question, yes, I are. am going to right now. I would say I focus on being able to really connect the four legs to the ground first. And this is work we do in all of our training method methodology. Mm. We connect all four legs to the ground so that your half halts come mm. through targeted exactly where you want them to go. Yeah, that's something you do at the walk and the trot first. Mm -hmm. And then you can do it in the canter through stirrup stepping. Mm -hmm. You can do it. And half halts, you know. Yeah, uh, for, in the walk so and the trot, you can do it through down transitions, walk halt, trot walk, trot halt into all four legs. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. And then in the canter, you can do it through stirrup stepping. And then once the four legs are well connected and you want to do a canter walk transition, I would canter and lift the forehand as much as I possibly can. So the canter becomes as hard as possible. And then you let the horse's weight sink back into the inside hind leg. So the horse is highly motivated to go back to walk. Like make the canter as hard as you can by lifting the forehand and putting more and more weight on the haunches. And then the horse will be so happy to expire into the walk. And then you have a good chance of getting a, a clean down position. Mm -hmm. If that's not enough, lift the withers, lift the withers, lift the withers, right a corner or begin a vault. And then in that turn, the weight of the forehand comes into the inside hind leg more, take advantage of that and walk him mm -hmm. as you're turning. That usually works even with the most stiffest resistance you know mm -hmm. inside i'd like mm, yeah i'd love to encourage you to sign up for our challenge next week because we'll be talking about mm -hmm. the simple changes and the fine changes and the components of these so that's right in line with what we're going to be discussing next week mm -hmm. okay so we have a few more questions yeah. i think and comments yeah everyone says except except i'm not i'm not sure what that refers now because we've moved on, lack brain power. So the young one isn't there where I really want her. So I'm training more these days. The half finger is also breed with selective breeding rectangle versus square. Yeah, yeah. true. Yeah. And then Laura says one more question. Mm -hmm. Can or should I practice the changes when hacking out on the trails, especially when the trail changes direction from right turn to left turn? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> That can be good, then it's not a big deal. You know, sometimes horses get worried about flying changes because to the riders, it's a big deal. It's, oh my God, it's a flying change. And it's like the beginning of real dressage. And I'm going to be a real rider now. I'm going to be a trainer, <laughs> you know. And so if riders put pressure on themselves and then that transfers itself yeah. to the horses. When you're on the on the trail, it's like, oh, go this just, way, this go that way. We're going this way, now we yeah. need to go that way. A flying change makes the most sense, yeah. right? It can, yeah, it can be useful in terms of um, lowering the anxiety level and the, the pressure the rider puts on herself and on the horse. And if it works, sure. I mean, if you try some flying changes like that on a trail and they, they're all failures and the horse changes in front but not behind, then I would abandon that. But mm -hmm. if they, they change and they see they're calm and it's clean, then yeah, do it. Absolutely. You know, then it's like show the horse, it's no big deal. It's just one of the things we do. It's like, you know, it's just a flying change. Nothing, no big, no big deal. You know. <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot you can do actually yeah. out on the trail. You can practice mm -hmm. a lot of things, especially, you know, if you have a trail that's not always the same width, if you have some areas that are a little bit more open. It's a perfect spot to do a volta. Then you keep going. You can do lateral movements. You can even do if it's you know not just a really narrow trail, but like a as wide as um, a road. Then you can even do leg yields or half passes back and forth. You could do all sorts of things. But I also recommend you just enjoy yeah. the time out on the <laughs> out there too. You know, let the horse look around let yourself look around enjoy you know don't try to school every moment either yeah see maria says i agree but flying changes over a jump it's mm -hmm. totally different yeah my horse will often get those but i'm clueless when it comes to dressage flying change yeah that was my observation it's like it's one of these things that sound like a good idea 
And then when you actually try it, you realize that, yeah, as soon as that pole is gone, the horse has no idea what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not addressing the actual issue. It's just masking it, you know. And that's why I I, I never use any jumps or poles for flying changes. I, I try to yeah, teach the horse the <clears throat> We didn't find it helped. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, we tried it at some point, you know. It's just, yeah. I, and I wasn't successful with it. <laughs> so I had to find a different way. Yeah, just posted it. Oh, you yeah. did too. Okay, Stephanie, I didn't even see yes. that. Stephanie says, like, where is the sign up for next week's challenge? So now you share and I you both got, posted. You got the link twice. Yeah, click on those. And, yep, you know, it's free. Take you there. August 21st through 25th. That's Monday through Friday. Yeah. And we'll be starting at uh, 8 o'clock our time. We're in <clears throat> Portugal. So that's also UK time. Yep. Yeah. It's um, five hours earlier in the U.S. So East that, Coast, East Coast U.S. Yes, yeah. sorry, eight hours yes. in California. Yeah. So, um, if you, when you sign up, there's a calendar you can subscribe to, and it will automatically, if you're logged into Google, it will automatically convert the times into your time zone, which is really nice. So Francis Eisenhower says, I compete but lose all these exercises lost in the moment. How can you use them in competition? You can't. You use them in your training. Yeah, exactly. Use them in training. And uh, so you have to teach the horse all these principles and the basic skills mm -hmm. so that the horse recognizes them when you ride the competition pattern. And so that the horse is on the aids, the horse is supple, strong, straight, all of these things in front of the leg, on the aids, on the seat, all of these, so that when you go ride your dressage test, it's just riding the movements that you do in your training. And the, if the horse is really on the seat, on the aids, and all of these things, then it doesn't matter if you're in a dressage mm -hmm. test or you're doing them in a different order. Yeah, um, these The horse should be able to do it. You know, the exercises we use, they're teaching tools yeah. to teach the horse um an understanding in a way and and certain skills and coordination and balance and at some point once the horse really knows the mechanics and and you know has the coordination you should be able to do the same things on different lines yes you know the up and down transitions the change of direction in different you know. different places different lines exactly. yeah lateral movements strange <clears throat> places on the quarter line or on the half school line or you know all of these things um a lot of people avoid writing a dressage test because they say well, i'm never going to compete i don't compete but there's actually a huge benefit to writing the tests as a self-test yeah. and you don't even have to ride the whole thing in its entirety in fact when you're going to compete you don't even usually write the whole thing in its entirety in the beginning anyway you write elements parts of the test and then you gradually put them together i highly recommend for people to try writing even parts of dressage tests find a dressage test that's approximately your level and try parts of it you will learn so much because you can't just insert three or ten voltas before you do your shoulder in you have to have the horse enough on the aids that you can ride immediately your shoulder in down the long side mm -hmm. or wherever, whatever you're doing. You can't just mm -hmm. go, oh, let me turn around and try that again. It forces you to be honest about where you are in your training with your horse. So Francis says he's so different in competing, though it's not easy. Oh. Yeah, of course, horses will be different when you take them away from home and then mm -hmm. the, the whole stressful atmosphere of the show. Arena. Then. So then maybe practice going away from home and riding somewhere else, even if you just haul out to haul a out to, arena. And, to go to shows, but yeah. only sign up for one test one day. Like I, we used to go to three or four day shows and you could do because you have to sign up for something to be there, but then only sign up for one thing. And then the rest of the time school in the practice in the warm up arena. And so the horse gets really used to yeah. these things. Yeah. A lot of that is mileage. If he's different yes. at the shows, it's just getting him used to it. Which is expensive. Mm -hmm. I know. But that's mm -hmm. what you have to do. Yeah. And some horses 
don't really care if you mm -hmm. go away from home or then maybe they find it entertaining they're better Summer when you're away better. from home <laughs> and some horses find it stressful you know mm -hmm. different environment lots of horses lots of commotion mm -hmm. and everything's different and so they they get nervous right? and uh they should be able to learn to relax if you do it often enough yeah just practice that trailering going someplace you know staying there in a, in a strange barn with you know, different horses horse. yeah. all these different horses everything is different the energy is different there's commotion there's excitement people are nervous horses are nervous that can be really contagious for horses they have to learn to be able to right. um stay with you yeah. even in those settings so it's good training opportunity yeah clinics yeah. you can teach you can train other clinics mm -hmm. You know, yeah. same thing, you haul out somewhere else, stable, you know, with other horses, then go right in a strange arena, you know, with a new trainer maybe, mm -hmm. and go back home. Our horses always came back more mature feeling, <clears throat> you know, from shows. Schooling, they, sorry, schooling shows yeah. are also great because they cost less, and mm -hmm. you're not going to get yelled at too much if you go off course and decide you have to do something else. <laughs> I don't know if the UK has some an equivalent. I assume so. Show. Yeah, the schooling shows in the US are not rated. It's very casual. It's very low key. Mm -hmm. um, you often don't even have to wear it's um, yeah, show clothes. It's a competition, but without that stress and anxiety of the competition, because yeah. there's no pressure. It doesn't count for anything. You know, it's something you can do for fun or just to get feedback from a judge on what you're doing. Practice. You know, practice. Getting your horse used to the yeah. situation getting yourself used yeah. to the situation yeah. because our nerves are part of it too yeah exactly mm -hmm. but yeah i don't know if the uk has something like that yeah okay let's see check uh okay. check all the places mm -hmm. we are live it looks like that's it we were about an hour now yeah, an hour and 15 minutes. We can move it up with that. We please sign up for the challenge and then we'll see you all next week in the challenge. Of course, if you mm. can't make it to all of the sessions, you can always watch the replays. Mm -hmm. Oh, Kathy says, Kathy Haywood Rand, we don't really have schooling shows, but can compete HC. So okay. what can cool. yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. That's, that's yeah. a good idea. That'll work. Yeah. yeah, no stress. So just take away the, the stress and the pressure, yeah. you know, so you can just focus on practicing yeah. writing or like i said you know, sign up for one test and mm -hmm. then spend the rest of the time schooling i uh, see judy peel says tasmania has protocol days when you write a test and the judges can make comments yeah that's help. really good that's kind of the same idea mm -hmm. yeah the judges in schooling shows in the u.s they're very encouraging they really try to help the writer get better so they they they, they formulate the comments like that instead of smacking them over the head like this wasn't good like, and that was not good. at this level <laughs> not at this level you know <laughs> instead you know if you do this your horse will be able yeah. to do the shoulder in better or whatever yeah yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a good it's a good uh, deal in a in a way for i don't know younger horses people who are not experienced yet nervous about competing but mm -hmm. want to get better and, and so on it's it's a yeah, it's a good play, place for you. yeah mm -hmm. oh francis says thank you you're always so good <laughs> thank you <laughs> that's sweet oh yeah that was fun yes. oh judy says i judge but would never ever make degrading comments so yeah good for you yeah that's thank great you. not all judges agree yeah. some of them really take great joy in smacking people down yeah. i've seen it yeah. um but luckily not all judges are that way yeah. thank goodness um yeah so please sign up for the challenge we'll see you all next weekend we're going to be live again tomorrow same time same channel mm -hmm. <laughs> uh we're talking about the biggest mistakes writers make in the flying changes mm -hmm. in training the flying changes yeah. so <laughs> we'll see you fun. then bye everyone bye -bye. have a great day great night whatever I know. <laughs> great ride <laughs> <laughs>